I have now the great pleasure to uh, introduce our next guest, Rainer de Graaf. Um, Rainer de Graaf, who is a partner um, of OMA um, uh, and actually um, uh, uh, has been working on many, many projects related to London uh, with Rem Kohlhaas, particularly the White City. Um, uh, as you know, and as I've mentioned yesterday, the marathon started here in London with uh, Rem Kohlhaas in the pavilion he actually uh, designed with uh, Cecil Balmond um, when we did the first uh, interview marathon. Ever since this interview marathon has continued, there is a kind of a new format which we call the mini marathon, which is not like 24 or 48 hours, but more like six or eight hours. And these mini marathons with Rem have happened in many cities um, uh, from Dubai to uh, Kassel. Um, Rainier de Graaf uh, and Rem Kolas have written a manifesto for the countryside, which they will uh, present for the first time here. A very warm welcome to Rainier de Graaf. Thank you, Hans, uh, for the very kind introduction. Um, the manifesto we have written actually is a manifesto that is quite old, but has been reinvigorated, has actually reinvigorated uh, by, by recent events. Uh, the title of it is The End of the Yes Regime. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall um, about 20 years ago, for the first time in history, the world has been truly united as one, uh, not because one country triumphed or the dogmas of a single ideology, a triumph, but rather through the voluntary uh, collective embrace of economic values over all other values. It is, very it is very, very, very clear that this has had a great impact on the economic system, but by now it has also had a very great impact in the domain of politics and culture. Basically throughout the 90s we've all become very familiar with immense queues standing outside museums for exhibition openings. Uh, testifying to the great success of the museum, but clearly this is only one half of the story. The other half of the story is the story of an enhanced competition, also in the cultural world, where an increasingly large number of cultural institutions actually fight over the same number of visitors, largely uh, f uh, pushing both architecture and art in uh, increasing positions of extravagance. Today, Basically, we find people of the cultural world feature uh, in the top 100 of the same lists that only 10 years ago only businessmen featured. In fact, it is increasingly hard to tell the difference. This is Jeff Koons with a tie and Charles Saatchi with a bow tie. I leave you to guess uh, who is the artist and who is the businessman. Architects, uh, artists can count on immense uh, audiences. Basically on crowds of adoring followers, and architects increasingly are celebrated like showbiz celebrities. The career options for people in the cultural worlds are multiple. Diva, icon, albeit an evil one, or in fact to continue on the same old cause which is proudly to present one's own work as unique and one of a kind. One's own work as unique and one of a kind. We have a unique recipe to put cities on the map. That recipe is copied by others, but what is more disturbing is not the rip-off of others, but is the fact that we are increasingly ripping off ourselves, where repetition and the one of the one-of-a-kind is increasingly the done deal. Even though the status of cultural figures supposedly is on the rise, their actual standing with those who ultimately decide their fate is perpetually on the decrease. This is Donald Trump commenting on Daniel, on the same design Daniel Liebeskind presented with pride. This pile of junk was designed by an egghead architect. Who are the real victors? Who are the real victors ultimately in a world where culture can be bought? This is the Guggenheim in Bilbao. This is that same Guggenheim anywhere else. Oops, it is the Guggenheim now built in Abu Dhabi as part of the largest export of culture or import of culture, uh, as you may wish to see in the history of mankind, where the world's largest museums and the world's most famous architects are literally built at minutes distance from each other. Tadao Ando and Zaha Hadid 
uh, where architecture is now basically the prime tool to market a region and push that region uh, uh, forward in the world. It seems to offer large career opportunities for architects, uh, where they build larger, more uninhibited, and, and, and more uncompromised than ever before. But for how much longer is really my question. These are the dancing towers of Zaha Hadid in the middle of an area called Business Bay. These are the dancing towers by an unknown follower in an area also called Business Bay. This is the turning torso of Santiago Calatrava. This is the turning torso in Dubai by an unknown follower. This is basically Daniel Liebeskind in less than 90 minutes from Denver to Dubai, also copied by an unknown follower. This kind of copy behavior seems erratic, seems improvised, but is actually very much, uh, in our view, part of a long-term plan to make the Western avant-garde uh, oblivious. Dubai Tower's trademark, it is the copies that are now sold as brands and exported throughout the world. Basically, a whole series of architects no one has ever heard of. This is Dark Consult uh, from the UAE. This is what they built. Uh, this is KEO from the UAE. This is what they built. This is Atkins, slightly better known. This is what they built. But none of these firms ever features in Domus or Casa Bella or, or any magazine uh, of the sort. But even though they never feature, and even though they're never published, their annual output is actually larger than the collective output of all Western architects generally producing in a lifetime. This is the annual production of each of the three firms uh, of skyscrapers that I've just shown. The skyline that emerges as a result is exuberant by all means, even though it is a skyline that entirely uh, exists ultimately of un un very unoriginal gestures. But if you again take this building produced by the most formally extravagant avant-garde architect of the West. Actually, looking at the skyline, one has to single out that building by a red box, because otherwise the whole thing is uh, unrecognizable. This is the skyline of the 21st century, so far of the masterpieces produced by well-known architect. This is that same skyline, basically produced by copycats, and there is barely, barely a difference. Um, Making the icons iconic, the ultimate recipe for an icon appears to be a, tot a tautology. Um, it builds on uh, well-known images, and it's always large. This is a gate that is large. This is essentially a pyramid that is large. This is an eagle that is large. This is a snake that is large. And this is the head of a horse in ultimate tribute to the Sheikh of Dubai that is, again, a very, very large building. Of course, the more obvious thing is the race for height. The race for height, where previously, if the World Trade Center or the CS Towers was the largest building in the world, the next one up simply starts by doubling that height. And it goes tall, taller, even taller, tallest. And currently, the highest projects in the world actually attract the same crowds of adoring followers that in our world, the cultural elite attracts. The city is basically an accumulation of icon. The city has become an icon of excess, basically made up of an excess of icons. The city is a perpetual promise of tomorrow, is a perpetual promise of the next best thing. Models go as large to equal the sizes of cities itself, and basically the sales office of real estate agents actually already provide the virtual urban setting of tomorrow. One day, all cities, will be built like this. It's the confident predicament of this formula that is now basically a formula that is practiced outside the West at a much larger scale than the West ever practiced it. Our Disney is their Disney, but Disney is still a Western invention, even though all the ridicule that the West actually aims at this point. But how much longer is really the question. Basically, a month ago, whoop, Basically, a month ago, the full impact of the stock exchange has become apparent. And it is also apparent that no remedy is, is near. Basically, if the collapse of the stock exchange was the result of financial greed, maybe this skyline is the exuberant result of a kind of cultural greed, the kind of equivalent in, in culture of the bonus system for, let's say, risk-taking managers. 
This is the skyline, and basically, this is the crash of the stock markets, which kind of interestingly minishes the skyline. But this is the thundering skies as they start emerging over the skyline, and as a result of the stock market. So pretty soon, basically, this type of architecture is a thing of the past. Maybe the graveyard of that type of architecture could coincide with the laboratory of the rebirth of modern architecture, a more functional architecture, an architecture with a social purpose, and an architecture de dedicated to performance and functionality. What we have tried to launch in the context of the exuberant Dubai is a new formula which we have called generics, analogous to generic medicine, where in the absence of patents, in the absence of copyright, in the absence of signature, simply the inventions of planning and architecture can be shared in a more uninhibited way, in a more good way worldwide. This is a building that exemplifies it. From one end, it reveals a massive presence. From another end, it reveals an exceptional slenderness, only to reveal a massive presence again. Basically, if the 21st century, if the 20th century, if the 20th century was the age of abundance, the 21st has been the age of excess so far. But what is needed, maybe, is a new beginning, a renaissance of functionality and performance. Basically, a manifesto, as we've called it, for a new type of simplicity, simplicity trademark. With the, not with the superlatives that have, have, a, have accompanied so many other brands, but a simplicity that is pure, straight, objective, predictable, honest, original, and fair. Thank you very much.